Hi, I'm Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook. I was the third United States Ambassador for International Religious Freedom, a frequent contributor to Network News, and I host conversations with Ambassador Sujay. So it is my delight and honor today to interview Congressman Tim Bishop. Thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. We welcome you. Madam Ambassador, thank you. Great. What most people don't know is I'm from the villages of Harlem and from Sag Harbor. So Suffolk County has been my residence for several years, um, four and a half years in Washington. I've had the pleasure of sitting with you at meals, dedicating the Greek Orthodox Church in Southampton. Yep. So it's my pleasure to sit with you today. Well, my pleasure to be here and thank you for your service. Thank you. So <coughs> who is Tim Bishop? Where, where were you raised? How were you raised? If you had to put it in a nutshell, who are you? Uh, I'm a local boy from Southampton, New York. Uh, I was r born and raised in Southampton. I'm the twelfth. I'm a member of the twelfth generation of my family wow. to live in Southampton. My ancestors first came to the village of Southampton in 1643. So I grew up in the house in which my father was born, uh, and I now live about 200 yards from that house. Uh, so uh, oh, quite a history. I, I am. I am. Uh, a son of Southampton and proud of it. Um, so Long Island residents are near and dear to your heart because you are one, you come from Southampton, so you are part of the community. Very much so. And, and I and my family have been very deeply involved in the life of Southampton for a long time. My wife was a, a school board member. My brother was a school board member. Uh, my sister's on the Southampton, the board of the Southampton Historical Museum. So we're a family that cares about our, our hometown, cares about our heritage, and gets involved to make it a better place. How many years as a congressman? This is my sixth term, so I'm finishing up my 12th year. It's been a heated kind of race this year, and so there's been a lot of attacks from the RNC. How do you respond to corruption charges, all, all the attacks that are happening? Well, unfortunately, the attacks have become a part of uh, our politics now, and I think it's deeply disturbing that our politics has become so toxic. Um, with respect to the corruption charge, I've been cleared. Uh, and what I say to people is that if the best after 12 years in office that the Republicans can level against me uh, is uh, uh, to make, try to make something out of false politically motivated allegations that have been disproven. That says to me I've done a pretty good job over the 12 years I've been there. Well, let's talk about the U.S. Congress because the American people right now are kind of hearing all kinds of stories. It seems like the brakes are on against our president. How can we get past this? Well, the, the, the partisanship that grips Washington is paralyzing. Uh, and frankly, the contempt that uh, that grips Washington is the worst part of it. When I first came to Washington 12 years ago, uh, the House of Representatives was partisan, mm -hmm. uh, but it was still possible to get things done. And members were still willing to reach across the aisle and work cooperatively to find common ground and move forward. That's pretty much gone, although I will talk in a second about a, mm -hmm. an exception to that that I was very much a part of. Um, but the biggest change, and this is in the last four years, is that it is no longer, it seems no longer possible to simply reasonably disagree. Mm -hmm. The disagreements are fraught with contempt and disdain. And it's awful hard to craft meaningful public policy when the people with whom you have to work to get there have contempt for the point of view that you have. Very much so. I mean, Congress created my position, so I was in the midst of all of that contempt. But let me ask you this. I mean, a lot of it is directed towards our President of the United States. If you had the opportunity for him to stump for you in Long Island, would you take it? Uh, I probably would. It hasn't been offered. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, look, um, I, um, I, there are things that the president, uh, pr President's positions that I support, and there are the posi positions that the president has taken that I that I don't support, uh, but he's our president, yes. uh, and um, I think he's entitled to the respect that the office uh, carries with it. Um, and that again is is one of the big differences. Uh, you know, when I was uh, when, when when the first uh, I guess six years that I was there, President Bush was our president. Now I didn't think he was a very good president, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have contempt for him. I didn't right. have disdain for him, and I thought the office that he occupied demanded respect. I and think that's the key. Word, uh, yes. and, and, and so I felt it was important that I and my colleagues give him respect. I find that too many of my colleagues do not respect uh, 
uh, the presidency of Barack Obama and consider it to be illegitimate. And again, I will say it's awful hard to craft public policy mm -hmm. uh, when one of the people that's part of the equation is someone uh, that you think doesn't have a legitimate right to be where he is. Well, let's talk about some of the policy that you have crafted. What do you think is the best piece of legislation that you have either sponsored, co-sponsored on behalf <coughs> of Long Islanders? I, I would say the two pieces of legislation that I'm the most proud of that I was intimately involved in writing uh, are two pieces of legislation that make it easier for students to go to college. Mm -hmm. One was something called the College Cost Reduction Act, yeah. which was the at, two, at that time the single largest increase in student financial aid funds for needy students in our in our history. Mm -hmm. uh, it also made student loan borrowing less expensive, yeah. uh, created uh, a program that uh, allows students uh, to get scholarships if they major in, in a, a STEM-related profession and then teach in that profession uh, in a Title I school once they graduate. Uh, and then I the thank you as a parent <coughs> of two college students. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. And then the other one is something called the Student Aid and Financial Responsibility Act, which got folded into the Affordable Care Act. Well, I was one of the ones who wrote that bill. And what it does is it, it took a wasteful student loan program uh, and uh, that w ran parallel with a student loan program that the federal government maintained, two exact same programs uh, in terms of conditions, b uh, uh, interest rates, and so on. We shut down the, the, uh, the student loan program uh, in which students were borrowing from banks and other private lenders, saved $10, $65 billion over a 10-year period, mm. and took those savings and put it into increasing the Pell Grant. So we wow. made the student loan delivery system more efficient. Mm -hmm. We saved money and we took that money and helped students get higher uh, non-repayable assistance grants so that they would have to borrow less. That to me is a good day's work. That's a good day's work and thank you for six terms. Let me ask you, <coughs> are there any, is there any legislation you regret having introduced or that you have second thoughts about now that it's been introduced? Um, not really. I mean, I think there are pieces of legislation that I have supported um, that, that need improvement. The Affordable Care Act is an example yeah. of a piece of legislation that I think um, has lots and lots of pieces to it that are very good and are helping uh, an enormous number of people. 13 million people in this country now have insurance, whereas a year ago they did not. But there are pieces of that law that we need to continue to evaluate and modify and improve. Can you talk about some of those pieces? Well, what were the, the advantages and what are I mean, some well, of the ones? Well, one of the pieces that we have to improve is there's a problem for uh, small business owners and a problem for businesses that are sole proprietorships uh, in terms of accessing affordable insurance. We have to fix that. Um, there's a, in my own view, uh, there's a tax in the bill on medical device makers that I think should be repealed. I never supported it. I mm -hmm. think it should be repealed. But, you know, on balance, 13 million people have insurance that didn't have it. These are our fellow Americans. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, allowing students to stay on their, our, our children to stay on their parents' policies till they're 26. Yes. Uh, Much insurance, needed, actually. Insurance companies can no longer deny a policy to someone who has a pre-existing condition. They can no longer de deny policies to families who have a child with a pre-existing condition. No annual caps on payouts, no lifetime caps on payouts. Mm -hmm. Seniors are saving billions of dollars in prescription drug costs because of the partial payment of the uh, closure of the donut hole. These are all good things. Yeah, they are. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and these are things that we need to build on, and th but things that people are really benefiting from. So let me ask you, I'm going to stay universal for a minute, and then I'm going to come back to Long Island. <coughs> you know what's in the news right now is the Ebola epidemic. Do you think if had it happened in Europe, it would have gotten different response rather than the continent of Africa, which is just seemingly out of control. What is, what's your take on well, that? Well, I think the three countries in Africa where the, the disease is the most prominent were simply overwhelmed. I mean, mm -hmm. they did not have uh, the medical resources or the training or the equipment to deal with an outbreak as severe as is the case, and that's one of the reasons the outbreak has spread as mm -hmm. much as it has. Uh, and, and I think more developed countries, such as those found in Europe, uh, would have been better equipped to deal with, with the outbreak. Uh, but now the global community has an obligation, it seems to me. Oh, uh, yeah, because it's uh, spread as yeah. here now. I mean, if, if for no other reason, self-preservation. You exactly. know, uh, so, but I mean, the best way to deal with Ebola is to is to uh, is to stop it at its source. Uh, exactly. So, and, and I think that process is now is now happening. Now, I'm not a medical person, but the serum that was used to bring the Americans home is there not enough of it to take to the source of it? 
my understanding is that that is the case. Okay. I don't know for sure. I also uh, believe that all of the treatments that are currently being put in place remain experimental, mm -hmm. non-FDA approved okay, treatments. Okay, so it's going to take a while. Uh, so I think it's going to take a while. Okay. Yes. Let's come back to Long Island, the place that we both love, where you've been for generations. How many generations? Twelve. Twelve. Okay. There are problems with the water bodies, there are problems with Long Island Electric, you know, it's going now from LIPA to PSEG. Can you talk about whether that's a good move, whether you think that's a good move, and how does that help the residents or not help the residents? Well, um, I, I would have to say that so far um, I would give PSEG, if I were to give them a grade, uh, I would give them a grade that's maybe a C, mm. uh, but more likely I would give them an incomplete mm. uh, because, but I, I, because I mean they've they've only been on the job for whatever it is, ten or twelve months, um, <clears throat> but um, um, I, I have been troubled uh, by uh, some of the. Uh, failure to communicate that we have seen, uh, particularly in East Hampton, mm. uh, with the placement of these enormous poles carrying transmission lines mm -hmm. going through uh, going through residential neighborhoods. I'm told that that's simply unheard of, that transmission lines mm -hmm. do not get routed through yeah. uh, residential neighborhoods. But there we are. I mean, to me, this is clearly a mistake that should have never been made, and PSEG should stand behind the mistake and fix it. Uh, and we're working hard to make that happen, but thus far, without success. Um, what about other sources of energy as we go forward? Well, you know, in the I, world? I think we have to increase our reliance on renewable sources of energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think offshore wind mm -hmm. has to be in our portfolio. I think solar mm -hmm. has to be in our portfolio. Um, so. And um, and there, you know, there mm -hmm. are solar efforts uh, underway. There's an offshore wind project being proposed off of Block Island. So I think these are all things that we have to make sure we site uh, the mm -hmm. installations properly. Uh, but but I do think that uh, our energy portfolio going forward has to emphasize renewables and we have to have an energy policy that is rooted in reducing our carbon footprint, whether it through, be through renewables or me better efficiency or conservation. Those are all things that we have to do much a much better job of than is currently the case. So let's talk about water. The water that's here that's been polluted often and then things like Sandy, you know, Hurricane Sandy, where we, how do we prevent, you know, destruction from happening again in Long Island? Well, let me let me start with the water. Okay. Um, uh, I think that um, emphasis on water quality, both mm -hmm. surface our surface waters and our groundwater, uh, has to be something undertaken by every level of government, from the federal government down to villages, mm -hmm. and, and it is happening. Uh, the county executive has made water quality uh, the signature issue of his tenure as county executive. Anna Thronholz, the supervisor of the town of Southampton, has done incredible work in mm -hmm. terms of um, trying to improve water quality and putting putting the town in a position where it can actually undertake projects to uh, to improve water quality. At the federal government, it's been one of the issues that I've been the most involved in. I'm the senior Democrat on what's called the Water Resources and Environment Subcommittee. Yes. Uh, we have responsibility to monitor the EPA's compliance or enforcement of the Clean Water Act. I've been very involved in trying to move the country, the federal government, back into the position where it is more supportive of funding wastewater infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. which is a huge piece of the degradation of our surface waters because of uh, because of nitrogen loading and, and other nutrients going into our surface waters, primarily coming from uh, our waste stream. Mm -hmm. uh, Talk so a little bit about that for a minute. The structure, is federal government and local government, how much is the state involved? You know, the government they're all, all, Every level of government is mm -hmm. involved. I'll tell you about the federal involvement. There is okay. something called the State Revolving Fund, okay. which is a fund that is seeded funded by the federal government. It mm -hmm. goes to the states. The states then create their own um, mechanism to administer it. In New York State, it's called the Environmental Facilities Corporation. Mm -hmm. Municipalities apply to the Environmental Facilities Corporation yes. for either grants or low interest loans. Mm -hmm. um, the Environmental Facilities Corporation makes their judgments. They don't have anywhere near enough money to go around mm -hmm. to meet the need. But what the state revolving fund is, is just that, a revolving Loving fund. fund. Mm -hmm. And so municipalities repay. That money is then available to reloan to, okay. other, to other municipalities. It's a good program, but it is not properly funded. And 
in totality falls short of what really we need to do. We have a $300 billion backlog of wastewater infrastructure projects and the federal government spending about a billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get there at that rate. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I've been very involved in trying to move the federal government in a direction where we're doing more. I've also helped create a new financing mechanism, passed it into law called WIFIA, which would allow municipalities to borrow directly from the Treasury mm. uh, for, um, for wastewater infrastructure projects. Talk about WIFI a little more. Well, it, it's, it's basically an opportunity, uh, as, as it is now structured in a mm -hmm. law that I helped write that Thank is you now, for it. Yes. Uh, that um, uh, municipalities could, um, you know, have a project in mind. Uh, they could apply to the environmental facility in the, our state, apply to the Environmental Facilities Corporation for either a grant or a loan. If they were unsuccessful, they could then go to directly to the Treasury and, and try to borrow directly from the Treasury. So mm -hmm. it is a means, another, pool of money uh, that municipalities could access to do what they know they have to do. Okay. I have a kind of a formula for candidates. Well, it's, I call it the pet formula, whether you are personable, electable, and teachable. How would you respond? Are you a pet? I would say, uh, I mean, I'm a very personable guy. I'm a very nice guy. I've had a I, I, um, I have spent my entire adult life placing a very high value on civility and respect. Mm -hmm. uh, every graduation speech I ever gave at Southampton College, I spoke about the, the necessity for civility in our daily lives. Uh, what's, the, what's the E stand for? Um, electable. Are you electable? Well, I've, I've been elected. I've run for office six times. I've won all six times, so I guess I'm electable. So let me ask you this question yes. on the electable. If you were reelected, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I want to continue the work that we have been doing on behalf of our constituents. That's been the centerpiece of our service. Uh, we've successfully closed over 17,000 constituent service cases. So that's something that's vitally important to our constituents that we work hard at, that we're very good at. Uh, in terms of legislation, uh, we have to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. I want to be a big part of that, and I, I, I hope I will get the opportunity to do that. Uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle recognize my expertise in terms of higher education policy. So mm -hmm. I, uh, assuming I'm reelected, I, I, I will be a big part of that. Uh, but I also hope to continue to be a voice uh, in the Congress mm -hmm. uh, for civility and respect, uh, both in terms of what I say and in terms of how I carry myself. Um, I think that you know the only behavior that we're ultimately responsible for is our own, that we can completely mm -hmm. control. Uh, and so I don't want to be, a, I am not a part of the problem that exists in Washington and I never will be, but I want to be a power of example. That's okay. And the T is for teachable. What else do you have to learn as a congressman? Oh, I learn every day. I learn every day. I learn uh, better how certain departments of the federal government work. I learn better how I can be a more effective advocate. I learn better how I can be uh, a, a more effective legislator and how I can be a better colleague. So mm -hmm. I, 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 mean, I spent 29 years on a college campus, so I uh, have great... Uh, uh, great faith uh, in, uh, or I have great uh, respect mm -hmm. for people who are willing to learn and willing to recognize uh, what they don't know and willing to recognize how much they still need to know. Talk about the light rail, why it's so hard to get a light rail system. I think the biggest problem is the investment in the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have the rail bed uh, that's, that's not, not heavily used. Uh, I think the biggest problem is the, you know, the tens of millions of dollars that would be necessary to purchase the equipment. And we're unfortunately at a time in our country where the question that's, that is asked is what can we cut as opposed what can we invest in. Mm. Uh, and, and I think, particularly for a place like Eastern Long Island, an investment in light rail has multiple dividends. It has dividends in terms of economic development. It has dividends in terms of economic quality. Uh, pardon me, environmental quality. It has dividends in terms of helping to facilitate travel and tourism, uh, relieve congestion on roads. It oh, has yes. lots of benefits. Uh, so it is something, in my opinion, that we should be investing in. But as I say, uh, the mindset right now at, I think, every level of government is what can we cut mm -hmm. as opposed to what, what can, can we invest. invest. You know, this year was the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. It was also the 50th anniversary of the Women's Liberation Movement. So there's been a lot in ter terms of whether there there's going to be a woman who runs as a candidate. But the Roe versus Wade was a major turning point in the history of our country. Can you speak about women and that whole issue? Well, um, for, first off, I think uh, the issue of women, yes, it's the 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. but um, I think women still have a 
a ways to go. And I mean, mm -hmm. we still have uh, uh, unequal pay yes. uh, for the same job. Uh, you know, one of the first bills we passed uh, when the, the Democrats were in the majority in the House of Representatives signed into law by President Obama, I think, in fact, the first bill he signed into law was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. That's right. Which was meant to correct inequities in, in wages paid for men and women for the same job. Mm -hmm. I was proud to be a co-sponsor of that, mm -hmm. vote for it. Thank you. Um, and you know, there's a lot of women's health issues that are, that are wrapped up in the Affordable Care Act that are really important. I mean, one of the things pre the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies could charge uh, women, uh, you know, much, much more for the exact same policies they charge the man because they consider a, being a woman to be a pre-existing condition. Exactly. That's, that's now unlawful. Mm -hmm. That's a big step forward. It is. Uh, I think the uh, a woman's right to choose and a woman's right to make her own uh, family planning decisions is something that is important, but I would also say something that's imperiled. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my own view is that you know, uh, as a personal observation, abortion is a, a tragedy that comes into a young woman's life and a, a family's life. Uh, and I think that I, I always use the, the, you know, the President Clinton formulation that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. I believe that. Uh, but I believe that it is a choice that a woman should make, not the government. Mm -hmm. uh, and with respect to access to contraceptives, um, you know, again, one of the pieces of the Affordable Care Act uh, is that contraceptive services must be part, of, I mean, considered a minimum part of, of any insurance policy th sold through the exchanges. I think that's a, that's a step in the right direction. Can you speak to the Hobby Lobby? Yeah, verdict? I think the Hobby Lobby verdict is a, is a, a wrongly decided uh, case before the court. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I mean, I, he I hear people complaining about having the government make health care decisions uh, for people, but now it's okay to let your employer make health care decisions That's I, mean, I, I just I mean you know mm -hmm. when you w w your obligation to your employer is to is to do the job that you were hired to do and the employer's obligation to the employee is to is to uh, you know uh, give a fair day's uh, wage for a fair day's work but mm -hmm. to then tell the employee we're also going to make your family planning decisions that's uh, I just think that's that's hard to justify just for your information, I've started a group called Pro Voice Movement for Women, and it's to bring black, Latina, and Native American women to the table, because there's been the absence. The first women's liberation movement, kind of, uh, we were absent, actually. And there's a big Shinnecock population here in, in the South yeah. End, in the East End. So I'm, I'm just really trying to make sure that all women's voices are heard, and that they're not just limited to pro-choice and pro-life, well, but that there's yeah. a voice in everything that I we do. I think that's so, look, as a father of two adult daughters, mm -hmm. I, uh, I applaud your efforts. I, okay. And I'm going to sit with you if should okay. you win again in terms okay. of pro-voice. But let's talk about some of the risks that happen for Long Islanders. Let's talk about wages and things that you think are, are where there's peril, actually. Well, I, mean, I think both big picture and, and little picture, nationwide and Long Island, wages have stagnated. Um, it's harder and harder for a middle class family to get by. It's harder and harder for a middle class family to stay in the middle class. Uh, you know, and one of the things that, that, um, uh, that I worry about a lot is uh, the, 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 the disparity mm -hmm. uh, between corporate profits and wages. Um, mm -hmm. uh, corporate profits as a percentage of the economy, as a percentage of GDP, are higher than they've ever been. Right. Total payroll compensation as a percentage of the economy is are, are lower than they've ever been. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you want to talk about two Americas, there it is. There are um, two Americas. And yes. I think that um, there's a lot of reasons for that, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, um, outsourcing is a piece of that. Uh, profit taking on the part of corporations is a piece of that. Uh, increased efficiency. Yeah, the uh, outsourcing the, is yeah, major. If I get another phone call yeah. and it's someone that's yeah. not an American, that's really yeah. bad for me. Uh, the decline of unions mm -hmm. uh, is a part of that. I mean, one of the things that goes often goes unnoticed is that so much of what protects workers now, even in non-union settings, mm -hmm. was created by the pro-labor movement. Uh, yes. You know, after World. War II. Or, and, and so um, I, I think those are things that we really have to focus on. I, I, I am a staunch supporter of raising the minimum wage. It would increase take-home pay for 27 million Americans because of the ripple effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hear my colleagues talk about how we have to cut spending. Well, guess what? If we raise the minimum wage, uh, we can save $75 billion over 10 years in programs like SNAP and other so-called safety net programs. So, and that's without spending a dime of federal money. 
So let's talk about <coughs> the number of businesses that are going overseas and, and how is the government responding, Congress responding in terms of supporting that or not supporting that? I think the Congress is not supporting, not responding well at all. I mean, one of the issues that we have right now are corporate inversions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I, I believe uh, that we should pass legislation uh, that essentially makes that impossible to do. Yeah. Um, and, and I know that there are a lot of my colleagues who believe that. Unfortunately, the Republican majority in the House of Representatives simply won't touch that. Yeah. I mean, they, they say something about how, you know, we should hold that issue till we do general tax reform. By the way, we do need to do general tax reform. I'm not arguing with that. But this is not an issue that we can let fester for two years, three years, five years while we're trying to work our way through a much broader and a much more vexing set of issues in terms of of uh, general tax reform. Uh, I think we ought to be penalizing companies in the tax mm -hmm. code that outsource jobs overseas. Right now we have a tax code that literally rewards them mm -hmm. for sending jobs overseas. That's wrong. Uh, I'm a, the principal author of a bill uh, that would tell corporations that outsource call center jobs mm -hmm. uh, that if they do so, uh, they will lose their eligibility for federal grants, contracts, or loans. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think that would be a pretty powerful disincentive for banks and other large corporations uh, to outsource their jobs. So those are the kinds of things that I think we could use public policy mm -hmm. uh, to create an environment that is more conducive to wage growth and more conducive to economic stability. So what do you tell <coughs> the middle class American in terms of holding on? How do they keep hope alive? Well, I think they have to keep hope alive uh, because we, we remain the greatest country in the world. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't quarrel with that for a second, uh, but we have to elect people who are focused on the fortunes of the middle class. And right now, it seems to me we have a fair number of people who pay lip service to the middle class and the support of the middle class, but then they vote in ways that are detrimental to the economic interests of the middle class, and they pursue policies that are detrimental to the economic interests of the middle class. I'm a guy, grew up in a middle class family. Uh, my father worked for the New York Telephone Company member of the Communication Workers of America. We live paycheck to paycheck. So I've lived the middle class life. Uh, and, and I still live the middle class life. And uh, so when I vote, uh, one of the questions I ask myself is how is this piece of legislation going to either help or hurt the kind of family I grew up in and the kind of family I represent. And that's one of the guides that I use to help me decide which way to go. What are three things about Tim Bishop, Congressman Tim Bishop, that we don't know, that you would like us to know? Well, um, I don't know. I think people know me pretty well, so I don't know that they don't know him. But I'll tell you three things about Tim Bishop. Uh, uh, I am uh, enormously dedicated and devoted to my family. Uh, I've been married for 42 years. I have two daughters, mm. ages 36 and 32, a four-year-old grandson that I that, thank you that I cherish. Um, uh, and I have a circle of friends that uh, have been my friends uh, basically since elementary school. Uh, my oldest friend is a, a guy that I was baptized with 64 years ago, and we've been, we've been together ever since. Wow, so, wow. Uh, I'm a passionate about sports, both as a competitor and as a, as a fan. Uh, what do you play? What's your? I, I play. Um, I play tennis when my schedule allows. Mm -hmm. I play in the congressional baseball game, which is uh, yes. a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I'm the oldest guy who plays, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been the MVP two out of the last five years. Well, so. congratulations! Yeah, I feel pretty there. good about that okay. at my age. Yeah. All right. So you got so game, as they say. I, I got game. All right. Uh, okay. It's it's diminishing a little bit as I get older. I play third base, and okay. for some reason they keep moving first base further away. I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Yeah. You have a minute. You have 60 seconds. You, to win it, what would you tell your constituents? Tell, what I would tell my constituents is it's been a great honor to serve you, uh, and it's an honor that I hope that you continue to give to me. And if you do continue to give to me, you will get the same dedication, the same effort, and the same level of commitment to you uh, that I've always, uh, I've always put forth. I work seven days a week. My focus is on the people of this district. I've not forgotten where I came from. I am a guy that cares about the first congressional district, knows every everything there is to know about it and is rooted in the people of the district and helping to improve their lives. So give me that chance. You've given it to me for 12 years. Keep giving it to me again. I ask for your vote. 
Well, I thank you so much for this time together. Um, you have represented us well. I thank you for the time and agreeing to do this interview. It is my hope that um, on the other side of this that we'll be able to talk again, but it's been my pleasure to share meals with you, well, to see you in action, as we call it Action Jackson, well, and uh, it's my pleasure. So uh, this is the you. diplomatic handshake that they do All right. uh, for the well, ambassador. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, and thank you for your service to our country. And my as pleasure. a fellow East Ender, it's always a pleasure to be in the room with a fellow East Ender. Again, we've been been talking with Congressman Tim Bishop and we thank you so much for joining us and thank you for visiting Hampton's Mouthpiece.